Under the Hood Show is heard weekly on this and other great radio stations across the U.S. Find out how you can participate in the show by visiting underthehoodshow.com. With Russ Evans, this is Shannon Nordstrom thanking you for tuning in to the Nordstrom's Under the Hood Show. Have a great day, and remember, PTLA. The opinions heard on this program, based on the many years of experience of Russ and Shannon, are offered for entertainment value only and as a guide to your repair needs. No claim to repair or cause is given or implied. Always consult with your own certified technician and follow all safety procedures before attempting any repair. To be a part of the show, call 866-594-4150. Under the Hood is produced by Prairie House Productions. All content is the property of Nordstrom's Automotive Incorporated and may not be used without our permission. Copyright Nordstrom's Automotive Inc. Now, let's go under the hood with the Nordstrom's Motor Medics. Welcome to the Under the Hood Show from the Autotempest.com studios. All the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. Russ Evans is here to answer your automotive questions. I am. Thanks for joining us under the hood. Shannon Nordstrom is here to do the same. Welcome, hoodies. Thanks for tuning in so we can help you tune up. I'm Chris Carter here to answer your calls at 866-594-4150. 866-594-4150. What's caught your attention in the automotive world? Well, you just sometimes you look at things and you say... All right. Yep, that might be a that might be a signal that things are changing in the automotive world. Yeah, kind of a you know a moment to pause. Well, I I had one of those brought to my attention here just this last week, and it it was it is uh, definitely a moment to pause. Okay. The Ford Mustang, the iconic brand of Mustang, in the month of May. Now remember, this is global production. Right. There were more Mustang Mach-E electric Mustangs produced than there were gas-powered Mustangs produced. Really? That happened. It, that did happen. There was Wow. If you, if you look at the production numbers, uh, I'm looking at an article from Car and Driver. In uh, 27,816 Mach-E's and 26,089 gas-powered Mustangs, and the Mach-E Mustang was the number one selling vehicle in, in Norway. Wow. Oh, times are changing. Holy moly, really? That is amazing. Yeah, I thought that was a, a fact that was kind of interesting to talk about. Now, they're still selling a lot of the, of the internal combustion Mustangs, but that is just uh, pretty amazing. What will be a real teller of all this is once that F-150 Lightning, the Lightning truck is released mm -hmm. and fully available to everybody, Let's give it the year, a year in production. I'm curious what the numbers will be stacked up in F-150 electric, you know, lightning vehicle compared to a regular F-150 gas after they both are, you know, fully available for a year and people can make the choice. Because in the beginning, you won't have near as many of one as the other, but maybe you will. Right now with the chip shortage, there's a lot of cars not being made, so maybe they'll have more electrics out there than they will. Oh, well, that's a good point. When they come back to production, yeah. where are they going to... Yeah, and this, this article goes on to say, Ford builds vehicles with a Mustang name in two locations. Gas-powered Mustang two-doors are made at the Flat Rock Assembly Plant in Michigan. The electric Mos Mustang Mach-E crossover is built at the, oh gosh, it's got to be a name that I can't, Cuddle in Stamping and Assembly Plant in Mexico. I said that really fast, thinking nobody yeah, would catch me on it. In Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead and laugh at me. <laughs> As first reported by Bloomberg, through the end of May, Ford built 27,816 Mach-E's and 26,089 standard Mustangs. The Mach-E was introduced last year, so this is the first time Ford has made more electric than gas ones. That I've, I'm, I, I am tell as I kinda... fascinated as you were when you were. I mean, the reason you felt compelled to bring it, I'm feeling that. Well, I have a lot of people that send me little nuggets, and sometimes I'm like, yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I was like, hmm. That's pretty interesting. On our Facebook group the other day, someone posted a picture of the battery pack from a Mach-E. Okay. Uh, out of the vehicle or uh, on the frame or however it, whatever the circumstances were. It, well, uh, the conversation, you'll, you'll probably not be surprised to hear, was mixed. <laughs> yes. 866-594. Oh. <laughs> a lightning rod. <laughs> oh. Let's talk to Mike, who's... Standing by Mike, you're on the end of the hood show. What can we do for you? Yes, hi. Um, I'm. Uh, um, I just bought a, uh, a 1955 Jeep uh, Jeep Willie. 
Um, I believe it's a CJ. I'm not sure on that. Uh, is there anything I should, it, it has been sitting for a long time. Is there something I should pay particular attention to, um, or look at, um, I want to restore it. And is there anything that, uh, that could have rotted on it, uh, in that time period? Everything. Everything. <laughs> I, that's just what I was thinking. Everything. Right. Russ gets a headache every time he hears the word Willie's. I do. <laughs> I do. I do. I do. Uh, yeah, they, they, they hurt when you roll them over and whack your head on the roof. Anyways, uh, that's got a steel top. Yours doesn't, right? Or what do you got? You got a, you got an open top, right? Correct. It's, yeah, it's open. You got a military Jeep, an M. I can't even remember the name of it anymore. But uh, we had plenty of those from the same guy, too. Those things replace everything in the brakes, just period. It's way over 50 years old. Every piece of rubber mm-hmm. in the brakes got to be replaced. Wheel cylinders all the way around your uh, your shoes. Check your brake shoes, see what they look like. But definitely all the hydraulic stuff. Your any hoses, the master cylinder, um, the wheel cylinders bleed the brakes. It's cheap, cheap parts. You know, compared to the the new stuff today, they're pretty affordable and uh, easy to do yourself. It's a do it yourself project for sure, and that's where you start. Make sure the fuel tank is not full of rust inside because that'll work its way into the carburetor and, and cause all sorts of damage if it does have it in there. If it does, you can get the tank boiled out. They still sell replacement tanks pretty cheap. I think they're under 200 bucks for a tank. Um, was, there, the, was, uh, was there quite a few places to get parts for that when you oh, were working yeah. on them? Yeah, they were they were plentiful for sure because they're still a they're popular. They sell tons of parts, even though you don't see them on every corner. They're selling tons of parts. I don't know where some of this stuff goes sometimes with these companies. I look at them and go, you're selling how many of those every year? Like, where are they going? Yeah. In the United States, people are buying thousands of this and that. Kind of like our friends over at uh, Dakota Digital. Yes. Uh-huh. How do you sell thousands of digital instrument clusters for street <laughs> rods? Oh, I don't know. We just do. Like, yep, the, I, the, you just don't see them. Yep. You look around and go, where are the street rods that have those in it? But, but then when you start reading an article about a cool car... Uh, gauge it's, cluster by Dakota Digital. Right. And, I always, when that happens, I go, oh, I Yeah, because they always have their list of the, who they help build their yeah. special build, and I see Dakota Digital. Yep. Oh, yeah, we know those guys. So whatever <laughs> it is, if it's a, you know, if it's a Camaro or, or Mustang or a Willys Jeep, you're, it's even though there's not a lot of demand or a lot of, a lot, they're not a lot of them on every corner, but there's still a demand for all those parts. So you should be able to get everything you need for the, for the Jeep. But we would go through the did. brakes first and tires Anything rubber like that? Hoses, belt, belt. Um, he did say he did have it started. Okay. Fairly recently. So the, the, um, the internals. Yeah, the- uh, I'm going to take the whole thing apart and and make sure that uh, everything's in in working order. I think it's important too when you do take a whole whole vehicle apart to take every piece and go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just a, you know, I mean. And, and you then may whatever. Not, you may not need to go as far as taking it all apart if you don't want to. If you just want to enjoy it, you might actually be able to um, just fix the, the, you know, like start with the brakes, the tires, put a belt on it, hoses. You probably want to put a fuel pump on it. I've had a couple of those old Jeeps I started up, and this was 30 years ago, so they weren't very old then. And uh, you fire them up, and they work for a couple of days, and the fuel pump starts leaking out the weep hole and out the side because it's just it's a piece of rubber and it's moving and it deteriorates. If and, if the internals of the transmission and the engine have not been contaminated with directly with water or something else, or you don't see any antifreeze shape. missing, I, I wouldn't get too worried about that. It's the external stuff that Russ is talking about that needs a good inspection, and some of it needs to be replaced. You know, probably before you start. Mike, thanks very much for the call. Good luck with that Jeep. 866-594-4150. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you on the Under the Hood Show. Hey, uh, streamers, if you noticed, there is sound now on that video during the break. So if you're on the stream and you don't have your volume on or it's real low, we put the music on very low on purpose. But there is music there now. And you could have heard us going, oh, geez, what, what, what's that? No, you couldn't have. They couldn't I, have? I took care of that. Oh, we should have let them hear that. <laughs> If you can hear the music and you're listening on Facebook or YouTube, let us know. Put a comment in there so we know. (laughs) 
car feeling ill? Don't want to spread it to your wallet? Call the Motor Medics now for free advice. Welcome back to the Under the Hood Show, 866-594-4150. From the Autotempest.com studios, all the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. Let's talk to Mitch, who is standing by. Mitch, you're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Hey, guys. Big fan of the program. I had a question about upgrading a truck that I have. I currently have a 2012 Chevy 1500 single cab work truck. I pull heavy for working construction and also for pleasure in the way of the camper that we bought a couple years ago. I was looking at F-250s and the uh, problem I have is I've owned one before. I know that the majority in this area at least are uh, for the crew cab are uh, diesel dualies. I have found one, a 2000 crew cab that is a single wheel gas and it's also a V10. Um, I was wondering if you guys had thoughts on that being an appropriate step forward into pulling heavy or if that seemed like overkill. How, how big are you pulling? Oh, I'm definitely beating the work truck. I've had problems with the Stabila track and such because I'm, I'm, you know, pulling heavier than what that's rated. What is that? Eight, nine. But but, thousand, do, you, but maybe, do you know so what? Maybe do you know what the on weight, average weight 12 is? Range. Twelve. Uh, other than when I go, yeah. Other than when I go to the dump, occasionally I'll see it on the scale. Okay, so I just wanted to get a, a gauge of what you're talking about. So yeah, you are definitely over pulling the fifteen hundred. There's yeah, zero doubt about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't wanna I wanna be conscientious of what I'm doing to the vehicle. I don't wanna just beat it to death. So it's time to step up into something other than the obvious, you know, it being a gas guzzler, this V ten uh F two fifty. Do you think uh do you, do you see any problems with that being uh, an appropriate step forward in, in pulling heavy or is that too much? If you're going to pull 12,000 pounds, just say 12 to 14, depending on how much wind you're going into with that, you're going to have problem, repeat problems with exhaust manifold bolts breaking and warped manifolds. That's We see that a lot with those. We've seen some injector problems with them. And you're probably realistically going to see... Oh, there we go. Got a little bit of trouble there with your phone there. Hang on, uh, Mitch. What do you... What do you think, Shannon, realistically, probably when you're pulling that much weight, five to seven miles per gallon, maybe? Yeah, you're going to be, on a good day, getting eight. You know, you're going to use a lot of fuel. Yeah, they now, do. And having said all this, we sound like we're doomsdayers. And these motors are used by a ton of people and companies to pull things. So you're looking what the worst things are yeah, that are going to happen. That's so the things that will happen. And those are the things that you're going to run into um, over time, but they're they're pretty good. My I, preference would be a diesel when you're pulling that much weight, unless you're only pulling it four times a year. That's that's exactly right. How often are you going to pull? Boy, you're uh, yeah, maybe oh, uh, 10, 10, 10, 12 times. Ooh. 10, 12 times a year, maybe. Even once a month, I'd be leaning very strongly towards a diesel in that. So. What what are you pulling? Is it a big camper or is it a construction trailer? What did you what are you pulling? Both on occasion. Yeah, I'll uh, set up jobs and maybe do five jobs at once and have uh, you know enormous trailer full of lumber or if it's landscaping, you know, full of gravel which is very heavy, and then you know also we have a camper. He needs a truck. I mean, he needs. He, he there's does. no question there, is there? Because a lot of people will ask him, and that's, this is what I was leaning to. And you already blew my question out of the water. I, I encourage people all the time to spend five or ten bucks and go weigh what you're pulling, weigh your vehicle, weigh what you're pulling, because many times, and I, I fell into this trap. I thought my load was heavier than it was, and so I just about bought way more truck than I needed in my situation when I was shopping for my last truck. When I actually weighed my snowmobile trailer with the snowmobiles in it, and that's probably the most heavy thing I'll ever pull with that because we sold our camper and stuff, I realized I didn't need the heavy towing package. I just, you know, with the 6.2 motor in my pickup and the standard stuff that it had, the gear ratio, I was able to get a little better gear ratio so I could get some fuel economy when I wasn't pulling. And so I made it a completely different choice after I weighed my stuff. But now in your case, if you weigh it, 
you're probably going to make a completely different choice because you're going to go, oh, my goodness, this is heavier than I thought it was. I I think you're, from what you just described, your 10 or 12,000 pounds might be a light estimate. And if that's the case, the gas motor trucks serve a wonderful purpose in the market, and they're making more of them all the time for people that pull medium-sized loads, pull heavier loads occasionally, and don't make the long trips. Uh, Because the short trips, those diesels, they just really are better when you get them all warmed up and let everything just really sing. Uh, Let the EGR system work. Let the the regeneration system on the exhaust work. Those newer, these newer diesels just work better when they can stay warmed up and keep, keep going for longer periods of time. The maintenance is more affordable on a gas truck by, would you say a third? Probably, Russ. Oh, yeah, and the fuel cost right yeah. now. They used to be diesel was cheaper. Now diesel's more expensive than gasoline. So there, there's so many pros and cons. Um, you know, if you're buying a used truck, the diesel breakdown repairs are ridiculous. Uh, they're expensive. The gas motor ones are expensive, but they're, they're, they could be close to ridiculous sometimes. But the heavy truck stuff to fix costs a lot of money. So you got to just kind of weigh that all out. But you are definitely in the need for or, or a three quarter to a one ton pickup, and, you know, at least a one ton from what you're saying the weight is. And then, you know, the single wheels are nice um, to find if it's occasional. They, they don't take up as much room. But remember that dually truck gives you a lot more stability when you're pulling that heavy load. Uh, more footprint to the road for braking, um, all those things. You can spread weight across that rear axle a lot better. So, I mean, there is a reason why they build those trucks for the weight ratings that people need. Sure, and just uh, my concern is obviously the weather. The diesel is harder to start in the wintertime. I had a lot of trouble with the diesel I had a few years ago having to plug it in constantly. Uh, especially where you go to work and then you need to have it plugged in what, at work. What year um, of diesel was that? It's very difficult. Also, uh, I think it was early thousands. And then also I've heard as well as you, maybe you can lend some credence to what I've heard about the dualies, especially two-wheel drives being dangerous in the snow. They do not have as much traction when you're spreading out that load over tires. You've got less weight back there. So, yeah, you're, you're going to have a little bit more sliding around. Uh, as far as a diesel goes, though, if the engine is working properly, we routinely have customers will drop off a vehicle, it'll sit for a couple days, and it'll be five degrees out, and they'll start without being plugged in. But most of those, Russ, are the newer diesels with the... 2,000 and newer, 99 with, and newer. With the high-pressure injection yep. systems, right, you know, direct injections. Yeah. They, they they have a tendency to start quite well. I mean, I know my sister's got... She's had Duramaxes for a number of years now, and... She lives out on the farm right up here in the Midwest, Vanderbrink Auctions, and that truck starts for her all the time. And, you know, it has started for her for many generations of the truck that she's had, probably clear back to 2005, I think she started buying them. And they've always started for her. Mitch, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. But, yeah, he definitely needs to upgrade that uh, towing capacity there. Let's talk to Jason, who's in North Dakota. Jason, you're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Oh, I got a question about an old uh, K20 uh, uh, Scottsdale. Okay. Yeah, yeah I got the SM465 uh, Muncie in it, and I lost granny gear, and uh, you get it in the first gear, and it's hard to get it out of first gear. I didn't think you could break those transmissions. <laughs> I didn't think you could either. I mean, it, it's... What thirty six years old? <laughs> yeah, that that transmission has been around for a long time. It's a all I know is they weigh about ten thousand pounds when you try to move them around. <laughs> that might be a slight oh, exaggeration. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. That might be a slight exaggeration. <laughs> it's weird. We had one in the shop yesterday. <laughs> no you, way. Four, four ten gears, really? granny low, three fifty, and just thought this is crazy. Big old cast iron transmission. Yeah, and you know, shifting it and I remember you know how hard those are just solid clunk clunk when you put them in in those 3 gears, but uh it, it, to find out what's going on with that, it needs to be taken apart and inspected. The parts are pretty cheap in there. Individually they're all sold so you can replace just one part. It's not where like an automatic where you take it apart. The part you need is the last one in the chain, and you got to rebuild the whole thing because it's slightly worn with clutches. This thing, you should be able to take it apart and replace just the worn parts, but don't wait because once it starts doing what it's doing, 
things can fall apart in there. And once they get into those gears and they clash, it can destroy that thing. So pull it out if you can yourself. Take it down to a trans shop that's experienced with manual trans and have them go through it and, re, you know, replace synchronizers and things that are worn out, collars that are that are burrs on them and worn down. And it's probably going to be more, I would think, more affordable than you're you're expecting, but it could be more if something major is going well, on. Yeah, and you might want to just pull the top tower off and inspect from there, see if, you know, anything's out of whack. But, you know, most likely it's not in the top. It's, it's down a little further. Yeah. And another option might be, our partners at Cardash Part, mm-hmm. you do a search on that, you might find an old cast iron sitting on the shelf that somebody just oh, yeah. hasn't sold, and they might let go for not a bad price. They'll just get another unit and put in there, too. Jason, thanks very, much. thanks very much for the call. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you on the Under the Hood Show, 866-594-4150. Get your planner out right now and schedule your next radio appointment with the Motor Medics. Welcome back to the Under the Hood Show, 866-594-4150. From the Autotempest.com studios, all the cars, one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. If you subscribe to the YouTube page or like us on Facebook and join the Hoodie Fan Club at UnderTheHoodShow.com, you could win a hoodie. Like Connor Bozeman from Davenport, Iowa. Congratulations from all of us here under the hood and our friends over at Universal Technical Institute. Have you got trained at Universal Technical Institute? Are you one of the technicians that went there and learned about welding, marine mechanics, auto repair, diesel repair, motorcycle repair? We're curious because they've got, they've got campuses all over the country. Mm-hmm. You may have gone there and got trained. But we want to know. Email us. Tell us your your experience. Tell us your story. Call us on the air. Tell us your story. And then once you you were done with that. Maybe don't call us on the air. I mean, it might have been a a time in your life where you were making some poor decisions. (laughs) Yeah. Don't don't tell us those stories about what you were doing when you were not actually in class yet. We we don't want to hear that. But uh, I do. Off air, yeah. yeah, we'll we'll just put you on the YouTube feed off off air. Yeah, that's that's all right. That one's legal. Uh, you know, once you're done there, you can you can you're trained. You can go get into a real career, a career like Carmax. Our friends Carmax, Carmax is hiring experienced auto technicians for many of its 200 plus stores nationwide. And if you're looking for a job where you can make a great living while working on cars you love. CarMax is the place for you. Join CarMax and grow your technical expertise and work with state-of-the-art tools and technology. Work on the cars you love. Join CarMax. Apply today at CarMaxAutotech.com. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Tom, who's in Ohio. Tom, you're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Well, guys, I have a question for you that's baffling people. We have a 2016 Nissan Altima, and all of a sudden, it's been in no accidents, no collisions, but all of a sudden, there is an icon on the panel that's coming on. It's it's in red. It shows a gentleman seated wearing the seat belt and an airbag deploying, and I can't get any good explanations as to what's going on. First of all, red is bad, right? I mean, red yes, is red a, is, is, a, is a red is usually thing. urgent. I was going to tell him. Yes, to, it is. I was going to tell him to duck. Mm-hmm. That, that probably not the advice he's <laughs> looking for. <laughs> well, that's kind of, it, vehicle my son drives, and he's been hit with an airbag before, and so that's kind of what he is saying. What do I do with this? Well, so I've been trying to search out answers, and I'm not finding any answers on it. So I'm turning to you guys. <laughs> I, this Russ, one I can Russ, answer. Russ, Russ just, just drew, drew the yeah. symbol, and I don't know if that's a good drawing or not. That let me see that again. <laughs> it's close. It's pretty close. It's the op- you've got him facing the wrong way. I think the Pillsbury Doughboy is in that picture. <laughs> I'm looking at the. I just pulled it up right now. That is the airbag. Is that better. That means your airbag may not deploy, right? I mean, that means it's there's a fault with the airbag. And yes, it's gonna go yeah. exactly. It's okay. a fastened seatbelt sign with a airbag in front of it and that means there is a fault in the system so it is shut down and if you go to scan it and you can't read anything it means the module's not communicating if you can read it it should have a code but it's it's 
definitely got a fault going on. Common things that would cause that would be um, if you had, let's just say, a clock spring that was going bad in the steering column assembly and it wasn't getting uh, communication with the driver's side airbag because of a problem in that area, it would do that, wouldn't it, Russ? Oh, any, yeah, any, any um, situation like a that. A seat with a occupant sensor with a problem mm-hmm. in it would cause that. Common on the Nissan, passenger uh, side front seat. Yep, a seat belt that for some reason has came disconnected or does not get the signal that the seat belt is uh, connected um, would do that. How did he get control of the of I don't know the video when I was talking there. Yeah, that was kind of crazy. I'm, but uh, so where it's happened. He was, but the uh, you know there's different things in the system that would uh, potentially cause it to go into this mode. Like, nope, turn the red light on. We're not working. We got to get this checked out. Right. So what the red light means, the specific light, Tom, is that your airbag probably will not deploy right now. And it is telling you that there's something wrong. It will not deploy. So you we have say to get probably. it fixed. It's not supposed to. Right. But- no. We got to say that's probably exactly because right. They have been known no, to do that. My, my joke about ducking was truly a joke because right. an accidental deployment in a vehicle is extremely, Don't extremely duck. Lean rare. Back. Lean mm-hmm. back. Yeah. As far away from the bag <laughs> as you can possibly drive. But they, as it's coming, move back, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If yeah. You're, let's see if you're quicker than that. It's like the guy who tries to outdrive the analog brakes. It's like, see, oh, I hit a deer. Lean back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Limp noodle. <just> sad. <laughs> So, yeah, you, that's, all, that's what that is, Tom. You just have to bring it in and get the code read and go from there or, and see if the code can be read. Tom, thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. Let's go to Terry in Nebraska and say, hi, Terry. You're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Hey, I got a 06 Ford pickup. I know all the ups and downs on these things. I've changed coils, everything on it. Uh, Took the timing chains out, changed and locked up the followers. But I drive from here to Omaha, 180 some miles, and it seems like in between there, I don't know if it's a fuel pump module that I haven't changed, but it'll lose power and kind of croak out on me. If I let it set, it'll fire back up and and it's good. Yeah, you could be losing some fuel, and they've got a fuel pump driver module in them that is common for them to go bad but here's what we see when they go bad great great quick test for anybody that has a a ford truck with a fuel module in it unbolt it from the frame and look at the back side of it they rust through they're made out of like a pot metal and they rust through and you'll have a big hole in the back of them physically yeah right in escapes explorers f-150s f-250s 350s with gas you pull that thing off and you look and go oh there's a hole in the back of it So now when we start having some weird issues with those, we go right for that. We don't scan codes or anything. If if we know what's going on and we're losing some fuel before we go throwing a pump in it or even testing that, just take the two little screws out, pull it out. It's if it's on the hoist and we're doing a physical inspection, it's about a 10 second thing to look behind it. And if it's starting to get pinholes in it, yeah, it, it goes in the trash. We get a new one because it's common. It's super common. Yeah. And uh, my question is, even if they don't get pinholes, it's got 150000 It's probably time to change it anyway, right? It, well, yeah, it could be. They, they shouldn't wear as a wear item, but, yes, they can, they can still get moisture seeping inside. And we see they, they rust from, kind of from the inside out. It gets through the seal on that. They're, just, they're in a position where they're getting beat with everything under the vehicle, salt and rocks and water spray. And- Terry, thanks very much for the call. Good luck. 866-594-4150. Let's talk to Tim. You're on the Under the Hood Show. Tim, what can we do for you? My son's got a uh, 2014 DMC, and I believe it's got the 6.0 or 6.2. I can't remember, but now it's a 6-something. He's having problems when he puts it in manual, manual drive that every time he kind of hits a bump, he says the whole dash lights will flicker and automatically drop down to second gear. Boom. Instantly. Interesting. Is this a 2014 of the new generation uh, that, that you know of, or is it a 2014 of the previous generation? I guess I don't know the difference. Yeah. I, I just know it's 2014 GMC. 
The two thousand, um, the two thousand, and it's not. It's probably not important to answer the question, but you're just more curious than anything. The the two thousand fourteens were like the thirteen down that had the like a smooth uh, door skin on it, whereas the next generation they put some some designed lines in the doors and down the side is just squared things off a little bit more. And so they went to a different generation of technology in that truck also uh, in the 2014. It has the direct gas injection motor versus the previous generation's motor. But it's, like I said, probably not important to ask the question. If you're hitting bumps and you're having th- the, the transmission drop into second gear, what else? What did you say happened with the cluster? He said the lights would... Even uh, this big screen in the dash that's in the middle, he said that would go completely black. He says the lights will flicker real quick, and as soon as they flicker, uh, the transmission will drop down in a second, no matter what speed he's going at. Oh boy! So you you've got something yeah. you've got something loose, a connection that's loose, or it could possibly even be an ignition switch that's having a failure and bouncing around. It's it's cutting some power, but somewhere along there, we're losing a power or we're losing a ground and it's affecting multiple circuits at once. The radio screen is separate from the transmission, but power coming in, you could be losing a main feed that is splitting off and branching off into a couple circuits that are both ignition circuits and causing that issue. So you just got to kind of start looking through one place we would look would be the under hood fuse box where they're connected. The top of the box is connected to the wiring. We see this in so many Chevrolet vehicles. The ones with bolts, the bolts come loose and they can be accessed from the top side. And the ones without bolts, the clips don't get clipped back in all the way. Sometimes people take them out for repairs and things and move them when they're doing some under the hood repairs, engines, transmissions, things, and then they don't get snapped in all the way. And a little bit of bumps will do it. And one thing you could do, you've got it. You're never going to find this transmission glitch parked in a bay in a shop, but you could find the dash issue. And if you, I got a feeling if you fix the dash issue, you're going to fix the trans. So while it's sitting there idling, somebody's looking at that screen, just move around under the hood area and just gently and don't push things real hard because you might actually fix the problem yeah, temporarily. Temporarily fix the problem. Just, just lightly tap on the, on the wires and go around the components, the fuse box. And if you find you tap on one, and it acts up, gently move it back and forth, and then follow it, try to isolate the area where this is at. You may find that there's a spot that's been chewed by a rodent mouse or something like that, um, angry opossum or something, I don't know. <laughs> um, or you might find a loose loose connection in there. Who who knows? But we, we do see that's how we go about trying to find these because we've learned the hard way. We grab wires and start shaking, and we go, oh, hey, it did it. But now it's not doing it anymore. Well, we moved it enough that it it made a little better contact just for a little bit, and it's good for a week, and now it's doing it again. When I was a kid, I used to chew stuff like that. Like like an opossum? Yeah. I wonder if it if maybe a kid got in there and chewed on it a little no, bit. No. I don't, think, saying, I don't yeah, think it's a chance. Probably not. But okay. I'm just, you might want to check. Put some cameras around. Make sure no little kids are climbing in there and chewing on the wires. Some kid off. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we want to hear from you. The phone number to reach us, 866-594-4150. You're listening to the Under the Hood Show. Get under the hood. Call the Motor Medics, 866-594-4150. 866-594-4150. From the Autotempest.com studios, all the cars one search. This is the Under the Hood Show. Let's talk to Kelly. You're on the Under the Hood Show. What can we do for you? Hello. Hey, on a, like you say, a 2017 or newer Super Duty Ford, uh, a lot of times when you find used ones, they got the bucket seats in the front, and that doesn't work for me. Uh, is it as simple as if you could find one, you know, as a salvage yard or something? Can you take that out and put the regular, you know, the little 20% seat with the armrest in, or is there more to that than we get, a lo- we get a lot of people that contact our business for seat swaps to do a different arrangement than what they have. And it's became more prevalent probably in the last year with the, with the vehicle shortage of inventories. Oh, sure. There's been folks that are getting brand new vehicles, can't get the seat configuration they want, but they can get everything else. So they'll start shopping for, hey, I'm looking for that jump seat in the center. I want to take my council out. I, and, and it seems like, I'm just going to say this, 
if you're trying to go to the one direction versus the other, and it's typically go to the council versus the seat, you do end up compromising sometimes on an option that you can't get to work in the council because there's certain things that are integrated into the, the body control module or the wiring system, and not just with Ford. That can be with others. Now, if you jump on to enthusiast websites uh, for, like, Super Duties, uh, there's blogs, and you will find there the people that have done these operations. You're not going to find them in a dealership, typically. You're going to find them in a blog on a, on a Ford Super Duty um, enthusiast page. Uh, or a Silverado page. Uh, that's where you find the. That's where I find the people that can do that stuff. Can you call your Ford dealer or the auto parts store and say, "Hey, do you know anybody who would have an, a line on this, a place that does this?" I'll say it this way: a dealership that has a very um, active, well, yeah, active parts department, a, a seasoned parts department, uh, a used car manager that's into figuring things out. Mm -hmm. They they have connections. They can tell you, help you. Sometimes I've found that there are manufacturers. I found this out with a Ram recently when our sheriff from town had contacted me here about trying to find a different configuration for one. <laughs> Is it, that good to keep in your, yeah. hold on to in your back pocket there too? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> we'll see. But the, uh, they found out in this case that Ram made a, a piece that was like not that expensive and it was available as a kit and it was way cheaper than anything that people were trying to sell okay. online from a recycling facility. But to answer the question, yes, you can do that. The floor pans are all molded and cast the same. And I, I have seen some of them where the, the threads aren't tapped out and they end up putting a, you know, having to put a plate in there or something like that. But that's been older stuff. The new stuff, it typically is using the same feet of the seats and the same mounting areas across that floor pan. It gets different when you start going to the second seats and the third seats. Yeah, like a suburban. It's like yeah, you then got you get buckets into, and then, bench. Then you nope. really got to pay attention. But on the front seats, yes, and that's where a, a resource like Cardash Part can be a good partner because you can jump on and see pictures. If people have got a progressive facility, they're going to take pictures of what they have in their interior, and hopefully it's all still together and you can get all the pieces. At that age of a Super Duty, would there be any chance of it at a... Uh, self-service no, lot? No, absolutely right? not. Okay. To go buy a 17 model Super Duty truck That's right now. That's the new one. For salvage? Yeah, I'm, right I'm trying to buy one right now. Yeah. And we've to, had a few, but they, yeah. were, they were Maybe you want to put Kelly on hold? It doesn't have the right seat. Maybe no, it'll... No, I tell you what, we just I'm <laughs> say salvage, like just like used cars, just like new cars. Cars don't have sel seats. Salvage vehicles are, are crazy right now. I mean, a 17 Super Duty diesel hit in the front, wrecked. Uh, we're going to pay anywhere from 10000 to $25,000. Wow. Yeah, what I'd, would you have paid two years ago? Thirty percent less. Okay, <laughs> I'm I'm searching right now on our 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 partner all the time. Autotempest.com. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's a it's it's constant, and I mean I'm I'm like going through every day looking to see what's going to pop up, and I am finding the prices of used trucks are creeping up on new. There's less new available, so when you get to a point, you look and you say. If you can find a new truck, even though they depreciate when you buy them, it's smarter to just buy the brand new vehicle. But like Shannon said, a lot of these things aren't coming with options. And I am, I am totally floored by the option sets when you purchase for a vehicle, how much they add. So when you're watching TV and it says, look, the new, well, like take this truck, the new 2021 F350 crew cab dually 4x4. And it says from forty nine thousand five hundred, price as shown ninety four thousand yeah. dollars. It's like how can you double the price of a vehicle in options? But they can, you know, they go from the the base engine to the heavy duty diesel, heavy duty suspension, the lane changes, all these things. Feature but, creep will add up really quick. Oh, I like those, that. Well, that's only another hundred and fifty dollars. Those on and the really seating like configurations, like Shannon said, can be a real bear trying to figure out. Because if you take one, let's say you took a console out of a truck with a console, it may disable a system. And I was reading the one where the guy had taken the console out and lost all his surround cameras on his new Denali. So, Jump onto an enthusiast blog, start asking some questions, reading some of the feeds, you'll, you'll, you'll find something. Kelly, thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. Let's go to Kansas City and talk to Mark here on the End of the Hood Show. What can we do for you, Mark? Good morning. 
Hey, I've got a 2017 F-150, and when I started up, and it doesn't matter the time of day, but I really notice it in the mornings, is um, I'll get a little bit of smoke coming out of the tailpipe. Um, it doesn't last long, maybe 15 to 30 seconds, and then it's burned off or, or whatever it is, and it's gone. Which motor you I've got? I've got the small motor. It's got the 2.6. 3.6 EcoBoost? Or 3. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the small oh. EcoBoost. Uh, two seventy, it would be a yeah, two seven eco, two seven eco boost or a three five eco boost. V six, yep. yes, it it all combined. Two seven. Eh, days, uh, it, it might just be moisture. It might just be condensation in the pipe. So when you start it, you're getting a little bit of okay. hot moist air coming just, out. Just a second, though. I want to go back though, Russ. Did, did you specify the color of smoke? It's white. It's, it seems to be a white smoke. Yeah, if it's white yeah, I'm, smoke. I'm not it, seeing any tent with it. Yeah, no gas, no fuel then. So it's probably just it, it's probably just condensation. I've seen that on a lot of we We have a lot of these vehicles that come through our shop, and we'll start them up when we're doing repairs. <laughs> a lot, huh? Yes. About, I mean. No, a lot of EcoBoost-powered yeah. vehicles. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and they're not all in there like, oh, they're all blown engines. They're in there for various repairs on brakes and tires and whatever. But when we start them up, and it's a – humid day sometimes we'll they'll fire up our cooler day just different conditions cause the exhaust to smoke and once they've run for two minutes it's gone and it's not any problem with yeah. the vehicle it's just it's just normal the way it does because once it warms up that catalytic converter is drastically increases in temperature and as it does it burns it off and it quits so as long as you're not losing any coolant losing any oil and it runs well I wouldn't worry about it at all. Would it be possible that, this is just me thinking of my simple brain, with the extra heat from those turbos, when you shut the vehicle off, is it possible that as it cools down in the right situation, it is condensing extra moisture than previous vehicles well, would have? Or? To condense, you need a cooler item so the air that condenses the warmer, moist air. So the turbos should dry out the system. Yeah, there you go. Theory. It's just the opposite of what I was thinking. Right. But... When you have a cool exhaust pipe and the turbo and all that from sitting overnight and you fire it up and you bring warm air through it, it can condense for just a second, get that moist air coming out the back until the heat of the engine overcomes that. And in just in, within a few seconds, it's starting to burn that all off. That help you out there, Mark? Yeah, because that's, that's what I, yes, it does. And I've, I've noticed that where, yeah, you know, like say within fifteen to thirty seconds, it's all dissipated and and clears right up, and it doesn't smoke after that at all. So I just wanted to make sure I wasn't doing something to this motor that was going to cost me later. So how do you like it? Ah, uh, I love it. I I kind of got forced into buying it. I had a catastrophic radiator leak in my previous vehicle and uh, uh, had to replace it. So. The vehicle? This is what I went with, and I absolutely love it, yeah. Mark, thanks very much for the call. 866-594-4150. You know, Casio will fix a lot of stuff, but there's sometimes <laughs> when it won't. And if Casio won't seal it, nothing's going to seal it, so it's time to... <laughs> Awesome. Time to talk. make that. I just You're fixed, talking about his old truck. Yeah, well, yeah. my mother-in-law's. I'm working on my truck this week, and I look over, and I'm like, are you kidding me? I've got something else to work on, and the radiator was starting to drip out of her old Yukon. I'm like, no, I am, I am, no I'm not putting a radiator in it. I just went right down to the parts store. Did you think about just leaving it and not saying anything? Well, <laughs> it crossed my mind, but so I drove into town at O'Reilly Auto Parts, picked up the Casio, poured it in, and I was done with it. And it worked? It did. Hour two is coming up. Thanks for being with us on the Under the Hood Show. 866-594-4150. All right. If you're watching the YouTube stream or the Facebook Live, I'm we watching. are going to take a break here. We're going to end this stream, and we will come back with a live video in just a couple minutes. We Thanks promise. for hanging with us. We'll be yes, right back. we'll do it. <clears throat> now I just have to do it. I wasn't ready to do it, and now here we are. You're... Are you, into the mic and I'm, are you going to do this? 